Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Find Your Model Health, the official podcast for those looking to optimize their long-term health and weight goals and understand how their body really works. I am your host. I'm Shemaine Linney. I'm an integrative health practitioner, nutritional therapist, and certified iridologist. And I'm very happy to have you all back with me for what's going to be a very interesting conversation. We have a very special guest on today, but before I introduce her, I must remind you that the information in these episodes is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Please consult your health practitioner before making any lifestyle changes. So today we're welcoming Dr. Karen Curitan on. Dr. Curitan is a naturopathic physician. She's an acupuncturist. She's a neuroplasticity practitioner, and she's also co-creator of the Wired for Wellness program. Karen, if you don't mind me calling you, Karen is on today to talk to us about what is a neuroplasticity practitioner, Um, because many people will not have heard of that. Also, what is neural retraining? We're going to discuss anxiety a bit and a couple of other areas that I think you're all going to find super interesting. So, but first, let's start from the beginning. Um, do you mind me calling you Dr. Karen or Karen or what would you like? That All of those are fine. Whatever you want, it's fine with me. So please introduce yourself in regards to your background. Like what brought you into this specific area of medicine? Yeah. So I love telling my story. So thank you for asking about that because it's a really inspiring one. Um, There are so many people struggling with anxiety and depression, trauma, chronic pain and chronic illness. And those are the people that I focus on helping now in my practice. And I used to suffer from all those things too, literally all of them. Um, but rewiring my brain was a critical piece of how I recovered from all those things. And the fact that I was able to resolve all those things is incredible in today's medical paradigm, right? You know, for so long now, our medical paradigm has been focused on just giving you a pill to try to suppress the symptoms, right? And in naturopathic medicine, we're not a big fan of that. However, we are guilty of doing it ourselves sometimes, you know, but we do it with herbs and things like that sometimes instead of a drug, right? Mm -hmm. But I was practicing just as a naturopath and acupuncturist for, you know, first five years of my practice. During that time, I was also still trying to figure out my own health issues, I originally got sick at 19 with a huge list of symptoms of various body systems were involved. Like I was losing most of my hair and my muscle mass. I was like extremely anxious for no apparent reason, super, uh, starting to get super depressed. I, um, was having hot flashes and night sweats and all kinds of crazy things were going on. So, um, I went to conventional doctors at the time. That's all I knew about at that age at 19. And, um, they all just ran basic blood work, nothing specialty, right? Just the basics, your thyroid panel, your blood counts, what's going on with your liver and kidneys, stuff like that. And they just kept coming back within range. And so the doctors were like, well, we guess you're actually fine. So why don't you just go away and come back when you have real problems? Because clearly yours are not real. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, great. Thank you. I love losing two thirds of my hair. That's not real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's normal. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. I was just like, this is hilarious. And also really frustrating. Mm-hmm. So I kept looking and luckily I found a naturopathic physician and acupuncturist, um, which is a miracle where I'm from. There's very few of those there, but there happened to be one. And I went to see her and she was like, oh, yeah. She's like, I've got some ideas about what's going on with you. I, I think you're going to get fully well. Don't worry. You know? And at that point, that was a huge deal. I just burst into tears because I had started to feel so hopeless after going to see probably at least five conventional medical practitioners. Mm-hmm. So when she was able to start helping me make, put together some pieces and start recovering, she got me well enough that I was like, oh, okay. I think I can actually go on and pursue my education. Mm -hmm. Right. At that point I was graduating from college and I was like, 
up until I met her, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to continue my education. Like I, I had goals to go to higher education, but I was so sick. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Mm. And then she got me well enough that I was like, okay, great. I know I can do it. And at that point I had developed a passion for wanting to help people heal like me who were just falling through the cracks, Mm. just not getting the information they needed to get well. So that uh, led me down a long path, you know, naturopathic and acupuncture school in the U.S. combined is six years minimum. Mm -hmm. So during that time, I got a lot sicker. You know, I was working myself to the bone while I was in medical school, as most people do. Mm -hmm. Um, And that really took an enormous toll on my nervous system. By the end of medical school, I felt like I was half dead. I was so burned out and so exhausted from, you know, really just just stressing myself for six years straight to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. And so then I ended up having to take a year off, try to get my health back. Um, It wasn't enough at that time. Um, but I started practicing anyway, a year later. And, um, that's when I really started to find all of the answers to what was going on with me. It's amazing to me that, you know, in naturopathic medical school, which is so open-minded and so root cause oriented at that stage did not have the education that I needed to heal. And so, Uh, I think it's probably come a long way as medicine has since then, but at that time they didn't know and weren't teaching about mold illness. They weren't teaching much about mitochondrial dysfunction, which is something I had from fluoroquinolone antibiotics that damaged my mitochondria. Um, And they definitely didn't know about limbic system dysfunction, which is what I'm all about now. This whole issue of nervous system dysregulation and how it impacts every major body system. So while I was treating these complex, chronically ill patients like myself who were suffering from things like Lyme disease and chronic viral infections and heavy metal poisoning and mold illness and all these kinds of fringe things in medicine, um, all those things are actually quite common, by the way. Um, And most of my patients had multiple of them to deal with. So I was getting them well from all these physiological things, stressors that they had on their system, but there was a percentage of those people who I couldn't get all the way well, like 20 to 25% would either get better, but stay stuck on their treatments. Cause if they went off them, they would regress mm-hmm. or they would get better for a little bit on the treatment and then regress, or they would just not respond to anything. I had a few patients who no matter what doctors they saw, no matter what treatment they tried, nothing changed anything. And so I was like, okay, we're clearly missing something here. And I, I still felt like I was missing something. And around that time is when I discovered neuroplasticity. And there was a woman at a conference who was talking about limbic system dysregulation and how people were healing from these really severe physical health issues by rewiring that part of their brain. So that's when I went down that rabbit hole, started looking into that, learning it myself, practicing it myself. Every approach I could find, I tried and tried with my patients too. And eventually I found a few methods that I found really profoundly um, transformative. And so that helped me to get well. You know, I resolved my own anxiety, depression, PTSD, chronic pain, a whole bunch of chronic illness symptoms. I would say that fatigue and, um, fatigue, brain fog, and, um, some food sensitivities were some of the things that responded most intensely to neural retraining, um, as well as some chronic headaches and sinus issues that I'd had for a long time. So it was a revolution for me, you know, and I started implementing it with everyone in my chronic illness practice, because it turns out to some degree or another, almost everyone with chronic illness is dealing with some amount of nervous system dysregulation and needs to address it in order to heal. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you some definitions now, as you asked for, you know, um, you know, neuroplasticity really refers to this ability of the brain to change right? To change its neural connections so that it changes its outputs, Mm -hmm. right? So when you practice playing the piano over and over and over again, your subconscious brain gets better and better and better at playing the piano. And eventually it's able to do it almost for you, right? Effortlessly automated, 
right? So you just, yeah, yes. Eventually you're just driving and you're like, oh, I'm not even thinking about what I'm doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same with, um, emotional learnings as well. Things that we practice a lot, we get better at, and that includes anxiety and depression. Um, so Anyway, I went off on a little tangent there, but that's what neuroplasticity refers to neural retraining, um, which is also called brain training or brain retraining, um, involves basically rewiring that part of the brain that's involved in your stress responses. So as we do that, that part of the brain starts to send fewer and fewer danger signals to the body that you're, you know, a tiger is chasing you essentially is what it thinks, even though it might just be, you have a work deadline tomorrow. Right. Um, and so it stops sending those danger signals for things that don't warrant it like work deadlines. And when that happens, a person is able to spend more time in that nervous system state of rest, digest, and heal mm -hmm. that, um, people love to talk about. And that is truly the nervous system state in which all healing takes place. For those of us, of the listeners who are not familiar with what the limbic system is, because many people have heard of the central nervous system and of course, fight and flight, but yeah. can you explain what the limbic system is so we can keep everyone understanding what we're going through? Yeah. The limbic system is the part of the brain that is responsible for determining in every single moment, whether or not you are safe. And it's making that determination based off of, you know, sensory information coming in through your eyes, ears, nose, et cetera. Um, and also data from inside your body. So there is a nerve that conveys all that information to the brain. And so it's looking for internal threat information like infections and toxic burdens and injuries, um, things like that. And if it sees things like that, that's another signal that can go to the brain to say, hey, we're in danger here. You need to set off a survival response. So um, all of that information converges in the limbic system. And then the limbic system has to make meaning of it, mm. has to make sense of it, has to say, oh, okay, so there's a dog over there. And over here, there's a person operating a jackhammer. Mm -hmm. Do do any of those things mean threat or danger, right? So then what, how it's going to make that determination is it's going to reference all of your past experiences, your belief systems, your thoughts in that moment, and your emotional state in that moment. And it's going to use all those things to decide, are you actually safe or not? So let's say that you have in your past a history of being bitten by a dog mm -hmm. and it was pretty traumatic. Right. So if that is you, then in that situation, your limbic system is likely to see dog and go, oh, danger. And then it will send a survival signal to the entire body um, to alert it basically to the threat. And the whole purpose of that is to literally change the way your body is functioning in that moment so that if you end up needing to run for your life or fight for your life, you can do it. Right. Or in the case of freeze, um, different physiological changes take place that basically make it so that you can serve energy until the threat passes. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're totally different states with different, um, you know, physiological and emotional correlates, but that is the limbic system's job. The really super important thing, in addition to that, that people should know about the limbic system is that it is also responsible for your emotional responses. And so, you know, that person that sees the dog and was previously bitten by a dog is likely to feel anxious, nervous, afraid in the presence of a dog, right? And that is the limbic system creating that emotional response. And so our nervous system states, fight or flight, freeze, and rest, digest, and heal, those three, they are all um, intricately linked to your emotions, Mm -hmm. And so when you flip into fight or flight, your emotional state will change immediately. When you flip into freeze, same. Um, and same when you get back into rest, digest, and heal, your emotional state will change immediately. Yeah. So I think most people don't really realize that. And I think it's an important thing to note that, you know, your survival responses and your emotions are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you for that. And I don't... I 
don't think people realize how much which we're going to get into is all these different stressors affect the limbic system response and your central nervous system response but I like to always just remind my clients because although stress is such a hot topic nowadays I still think people think of stress as just the emotional work relationships kids stress like I have a list of to do's kind of stress but yes. it can also be that you're not sleeping I am notorious for overtraining and I will just get a huge stress response. Um, people don't realize under eating calories, carbohydrates, like you mentioned, infections, medications, these will all activate the stress response as well. It's not just the woo-woo emotional that we associate mm -hmm. stress with. And it's important for people to understand that like sleep, the biggest stressor I think out there. Yeah. And, you know, I would just add to that. I think, uh, you know, the other thing for people to pay attention to in their life is not just things they associate with. Like, I think a lot of people think stress means like that feeling of sort of pressure mm -hmm. or like too much to do too overburdened, you know, those kinds of things. But from a physiological perspective, from the way your body works, stress is also when you are grieving, or, you know, when you are extremely angry about something um, or any other emotional state that you find uncomfortable, unpleasant, or that you don't really love to be in, that is equated to a stress response. So guilt, shame, you know, all these things. So I like people to think about that when they're trying to assess, is my nervous system dysregulated, right? A lot of people ask me, how would I know if my nervous system is dysregulated, i.e. spending too much time in mm -hmm. fight or flight? And that's one of the easiest ways to know is how much time you spend emotionally in, you know, negative states, right? States that we don't like. I don't like to call them negative because they are part of the normal human emotional experience, mm -hmm. but they are also unpleasant. And a lot of us feel like they feel pretty heavy and negative. So those emotional states as well, like look at your life and see if you're spending a lot of time in one of those states. If you are, then you are dysregulated and you could use some help with your nervous system. That's like to use the words because I think people understand best that chronic stress like uh, am I angry I'm going to refer to me lately I've been angry more than I've been happy because of the overwhelm that you mentioned I have a lot to do it's I I think sometimes people think like with your story my story many others people think as health practitioners we're exempt we're healthy <laughs> we're totally we're here to teach you how to be healthy uh -huh. I'm like no like it, it, pro I think sometimes being a health practitioner is probably one of the most stressful jobs because you're dealing with everyone else's as well but um yes. no like for for me I've I've have lately been spending more time in anger than in joy and being snappy and irritable but I yeah. also have been wearing a continuous blood glucose monitor just to I don't have pre-diabetes but I wanted to see what was impacting my blood sugars and stress of course my blood sugars go up to almost seven when I am usually in the four to five range and it, it's it's enlightening to see stuff like that but again it's it's more than what people think it is it's not just oh I'm stressed it's so much more yeah yeah and I think that the other thing that people don't realize is how that is impacting every single body system, right? Whatever form of stress we're talking about, you know, whether it is a chronic infection or, you know, a toxic burden, or it is just a psychological stress, mm -hmm. no matter what you're having intense physiological impacts on the whole body. So most people know, I think that when you're in fight or flight, your pulse rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up and you start breathing rapidly and shallowly right? But other things are taking place too, right? Digestion is largely being shut down um, because why would you do that when you're running from a tiger? It's not a good use of energy, right? And so you're evolutionarily, your body knows that. And so it has developed this mechanism to push all the energy to the muscles and to the heart um, to help you fight 
or run for your life, right? But other things that are happening are tense muscles. You know, when people say, oh, I carry all my stress in my neck and shoulders and oh, my body is so tight in general. Like my massage therapist says, I'm always tight as a bowstring, Mm -hmm. right? When that is the case and physical medicine modalities don't make a lot of difference, it's usually because of nervous system dysregulation that is keeping the muscles tight. Mm -hmm. Um, And because that is advantageous if you need to run away or fight for your life. But also hormonal systems are totally imbalanced as you were referring to with glucose, but that also includes sex hormones, adrenal and thyroid. Um, The immune system becomes significantly imbalanced, shifting towards allergies and autoimmunity and away from the ability to fight infections best. And that's particularly with chronic stress. So all these things are taking place and that's just fight or flight. Freeze has other Mm -hmm. issues that it induces. And just briefly, the biggest ones that people may notice in themselves are fatigue, brain fog, feeling a little bit checked out. Um, And then like all over fibromyalgia type body pain can also be associated with being in a chronic freeze state. Mm -hmm. And in that state, people usually emotionally feel depressed, um, unmotivated, like lethargic, like, oh, nothing, nothing is worth it. I don't want to engage in anything. They usually feel like, you know, the things that they normally enjoy, they just don't care about. Right. So a lot of people don't realize that chronic depression is often a result of a chronic freeze state and the, um, literature on anxiety and depression and how they relate to nervous system dysregulation is very robust. Can you, before we move on, just mention how all this also impacts, we've mentioned hormones, but how does this impact fertility? Because we're seeing a big rise in fertility problems nowadays. Yeah, for sure. I think there are probably a lot of ways it affects fertility. I'm not a fertility specialist. However, what I do know about the hormonal implications is that when you are secreting a lot of cortisol, because that's your primary stress hormone, it that cortisol comes from the same hormonal precursor as your sex hormones. Mm -hmm. And so if you're producing a lot of cortisol from that precursor, you're going to deplete the pool that is needed to make sex hormones. And so in women, what that usually results in is lower and lower progesterone over time. And if uh, resources are really slim, then estrogen also goes down. Right. And progesterone we know is needed for, you know, that implanted, uh, fetus to, to remain there, right? We need the lining of the uterus to stay intact and you need progesterone to do that. Um, so that's a big correlate, but for men, usually the cortisol steel, um, you know, where cortisol is being overproduced and affecting sex hormones for men usually causes low testosterone. And I see that in my practice a lot, even in men who are in their twenties and thirties. I'm glad you brought in men because it's important that we mention this isn't just women. We know men have more resiliency when it comes to stress, but this does affect both of us. It's not just women. We maybe are juggling more at the one time, but this is not just isolated to being a female. This will affect men as well. Like I see men, I just saw thyroid results off one of my male clients this morning and I just went oh like this explains everything and he used to work as a prison guard so it's his past that he did 10 or 20 years ago it's still hanging around and people yeah. think well I'm not in that job anymore it's been a decade but it's still imprinted there on your central nervous system and we can see it Yes, that's so that's a good point. So, you know, when somebody has gone through like a period of intense chronic stress, like I did for medical school, as an example, or like this gentleman did as a prison guard or somebody else did on military duty, intense periods of chronic stress often lead to nervous system dysregulation. And the reason is because practice makes perfect in the brain, right? So the more that you unintentionally practice the state of feeling stressed or anxious, the more you tell the limbic system, my life is not safe. That's what that signal means to your brain. And so then your brain will go, oh, okay, your life is not safe. And it will continue to ramp up its stress signaling 
um, as long as that goes on. And so that's how sometimes people, let's say they felt like stressed five out of 10 while they were in it. And then suddenly like years pass, they're starting to tick up to six, seven, eight, and now they're having panic attacks. Mm -hmm. right? That is not uncommon. So I actually just read this awesome study yesterday for a presentation I'm making of these um, young military age men who were going through basic training. And so they, during basic training, exposed them to some super stressful situations, which is part of the training. It's mm -hmm. part of the deal, right? And um, the people who felt the most stress in those situations that were you know, they were putting them in, uh, those people went on to develop what they call anxiety sensitivity and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's because their brain felt like that scenario was more threatening than somebody else's. And they didn't consciously make that choice. That's just what their brain decided based on their past and their belief systems. Mm -hmm. Right. But what it led to, was worse dysregulation after the event. And so this is not to put blame on anyone or say anyone is intentionally in any way able to control this process. But the interesting thing is the more you know about it, the more you can control it, right? We now have the tools that allow us to hack what our brain stores emotionally. So if we go through a really intense experience, a trauma, a period of chronic stress or whatever, we can use neuroplasticity tools to rewire that immediately so that it doesn't impact us for years or decades, which is what is uh, commonly the case from all of our stressful experiences, the most intense ones, even more so. So it really is a case of our pasts are haunting us. We're our pasts to... are our present in many ways. Yeah, we, we, oh, I can't emphasize this enough because people, we really think we left our past in the past. <laughs> I'm going to use an example. I emigrated from Ireland 10 years ago and thinking I was leaving my past in the past, but it yeah. still like lingers. There's no getting rid of it, but people think, well, I'm not in that marriage anymore. I'm married to a new guy and he's great kind of thing. Well, you, you still have that imprint. So what I think you're saying then, which is what we're going to move into next, is that the wash, rinse, repeat of these negative thoughts and these negative experiences are compounding who we are today and how we're feeling and responding to stress but you can correct me if I'm wrong which I think is where we're going now is that this the alternative can be said that if we wash rinse repeat the positives and correct me if I'm wrong I think this is what it is um we can start to unravel some of that yeah so um with neural retraining, there are different styles of it. There are very simplistic styles and there are more uh, comprehensive styles, I should say. So the very simplistic style is to practice what you want more of, right? So just like playing the piano every day, if you want to feel more gratitude, you need to practice it. You need to practice it regularly so that your neurons um, you know, start to link up around creating gratitude for you. And that, um, neural connection just gets stronger and stronger and stronger the more you practice it. And then eventually your brain will start producing gratitude for you without you having to effort at it. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like playing the piano. So, um, so that is one style and it does work in a lot of situations, but there are situations in which it does not work. So let's talk about that. The situations in which it doesn't work are usually ones in which somebody has a really intense experience related to that trigger from their past, right? So, you know, let's say it's um, medical trauma, right? This is a big one that I work with a lot of people on. Uh, so let's say in the past, they had an experience with a doctor who was demeaning, demissed them, made them feel, you know, like there was something wrong with them you know, and just generally was disrespectful, right? And it left a traumatic imprint for that person because they went asking for help, right? Mm -hmm. And they got mistreated. So um, that person, if they have more experiences like that, especially is likely to grow a neural network in the limbic system that says, hey, doctors are not safe, right? Mm -hmm. So then if that person goes to see the doctor again, there, even if it's a different doctor, 
it's very likely that they're going to feel anxious or uncomfortable in that situation now because the brain is tagged doctors as threat. So that person could take the approach of, okay, I'm just going to try to practice feeling really, really safe as I go into the doctor's office when I'm in the doctor's office and when I leave the doctor's office. And for some people that'll work for a lot of people, it won't. And it's also, if it does work, it's slower. So the faster way is to go, okay, this is clearly based on these traumas you had with these other doctors. Let's quickly rewire those so that the basis for this reactivity to doctors is gone, right? The foundation or the roots of this tree are no longer there. Once they're not there, breaking down the rest of the tree, which I like to call the neural habit you have formed, mm -hmm. gets so much easier because you are no longer fighting your subconscious. Yeah? Your subconscious is trying to, at all times, keep you safe, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're sitting there telling it, no, 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 the doctor's safe. And it's like, what are you talking about? We have these three horrific experiences with doctors. No, it's not safe. So that is what happened to me when I tried the simplistic versions and for a lot of my clients too, not all of them, but some, um, is I just felt like I was butting heads with myself every day. As I tried to sit down, I just felt this wall of internal resistance. And so what ended up working for me was this deeper approach where it allowed me to rewire my traumas, which I had a decent amount of mostly small T, a few big T mm -hmm. and, um, the, process of rewiring a trauma is so incredibly fast um, that it's probably my favorite thing I do actually um, is help people rewire trauma. Like you can, so let's say it's a really big T trauma like rape. That might take a total of three sessions. That's That would be typical. <laughs> Whereas like, let's say it's a bunch of medium traumas. Sometimes I can rewire like eight of those with somebody in a single session. So what that means is session. a session is two hours usually. And how so, often would one do? So you said with rape, it would be three. So would that be two hours every week or how, how would that's that often how people are doing it? Yeah. Once a week until they reach their rewiring goal, you know, um, usually the private sessions I'm only doing with big ticket items like that. Yeah. At this point, I've found that my clients actually do better if they're able to do a lot of the rewiring work on their own in their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. um, and there's very uh, obvious reasons for that in the way our brains work. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's why I created the Wired for Wellness program, which is a group program where people can use plug and play neural retraining processes to rewire whatever they want to rewire in terms of their emotional brain. So um, we teach people how to rewire memories with those processes, belief systems. And, you know, a lot of these processes are geared towards the common stress patterns we see people playing out, right? Like we've got processes for the perfectionists out there and processes for the people with severe health anxiety, you know, um, because the stress patterns, ultimately we see them over and over and over again in all our clients. So we might as well, right? Yeah. So we find that if people do a daily practice where they're doing a little bit of rewiring work every day using those guided processes. And then if they have any big ticket stuff, like big T traumas, they get a little help rewiring that, then that is the fastest way usually that people get to their goals in terms of rewiring the brain. Um, so that's, that's the method I use. And that method involves this process called memory reconsolidation, which you can uh, read about in the research um, basically it refers to the fact that every time our memories are recalled, they change a little bit and they change a little bit based on what's happening in the present when we recalled them. So based on that, we know that when we recall a memory, we can change it. We can intentionally change it. Right. And so science has now proven that, um, to be the case. And so that's what I do with people all day long, but that same process, works with other types of neural networks, like where your belief systems are stored and things like that. So we use it to rewire all kinds of things in the brain. And it's amazing. So your program that you designed for this, that is online and people are giving step-by-step -step instructions or how does that work? 
Yeah. So it's online and most of the content is pre-recorded, so people can go at their own pace with learning. Like there's an enormous educational component to it because as you talked about in the beginning, most people don't know what neuro retraining is at all. And they don't know much about how the brain and nervous system work in terms of their health. So we start by doing a lot of education in regards to that, you know, learning about emotions, how do emotions work, all kinds of stuff. And then we teach you the nuts and bolts of how do these rewiring processes work, right? Because that was what was transformative for me when I actually learned how all of this uh, rewiring work happens in the brain, then it was like, ah, I can, I can change this. I can play with this and make it work the best for me. Right. And so that's what we encourage our clients to do is say, Hey, here's the framework. Um, you know, tailor this to yourself, right? If you tend to do better with one type of process than another, great, go for that. There's, there's variety for that reason. Yeah. So then people start using those guided processes in there to rewire all kinds of things in their everyday lives. And usually that process for somebody who starts out very sick and very dysregulated, I would say their typical timeline for reaching their goals of complete regulation and total health mm -hmm. ranges somewhere between six and 18 months for the average person. Okay. If they only started out with like one issue, like, oh yeah, I have migraines. Yeah. That they are likely to get rid of those migraines within a month. Same thing with insomnia. Most of our members get rid of insomnia in a matter of days to a week. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it just kind of depends on what they're coming in with. And how would this, I have two specific questions, but how would this, re I deal a lot with weight issues and weight management with my clients um, and food addiction and a lot of nutritional therapy. How yes. would this help someone with food issues and weight issues especially when it comes to using food to help deal with emotions which is what nearly everybody does yeah absolutely yeah you know there's a couple layers to that I think but the first layer is just like like you're saying when we have stress responses um, one of our tendencies is to look around for a way to make it feel better right that is the human condition mm -hmm. um is to go, oh, this hurts. What am I going to do about it? I need to make that go away. And so some of us turn to food, some of us turn to other things, TV and sex and whatever. Um, but yes, that is, if we don't have a better or equally useful way of coping with our emotions, then, then most people are going to gravitate towards, you know, readily available things like food. And so, um, when people get better regulated and they stop, you know, bouncing between anger and anxiety and depression all the time, there just isn't that compulsion to eat all the time, right? There isn't this need to constantly cope. And that's what I love about this work is it's not like meditation or yoga where you have a temporary calming effect. Um, but for most people, it wears off fairly quickly and then they're back to their stress state. Mm -hmm. This approach actually changes how often you end up in a stress state because you are training your brain to be more resilient, to stop popping into that feeling of being threatened all the time. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is less and less emotional dysregulation with time as you rewire your brain. But you can also use these tools very specifically to deal with um, food addiction or um with weight, I should say just generally, um, when somebody gets better regulated, they're likely to lose weight. The main reason is that, you you know, as somebody has high levels of cortisol in the system, the stress hormone, they tend to pump a lot of glucose into the bloodstream, right? And if they can't use it, they store it, usually in the midsection, mm -hmm. right? So when cortisol starts to come down, usually the weight starts to as well. But um, with emotional eating, you can very directly rewire the underlying patterning. It's very interesting when you ask questions of somebody about their history with food, you will very easily discover the roots of their emotional eating pattern. You know, like one of my clients um, 
her uh, mother and grandmother, she grew up with both of them and they both uh, struggled with weight and body shame. And they would hate on themselves in front of her all the time when she was little. And simultaneously, they would cope with their negative feelings about themselves with food. Mm -hmm. And they encouraged her to do the same, right? Every time she did something good, the reward was food. Every time there was a special event, the reward was food, right? And um, they simultaneously didn't teach her any other ways of coping with her emotions, right? So she did just as they did and just leaned on the thing that she learned very early on could make a difference for her. So on one hand, they were rewarding her with food, but on the other hand, she was seeing them hate on themselves for how they looked and their own habits so yeah conflicting advice being given to at the time a little girl who didn't know any better yeah so it's not surprising she she also grew up to hate her body and to cope with that with food yeah yeah which is so more common than not common when you look at um, women and how we look at our bodies nowadays and relate to food so yes before we go on to your program um if someone would because I have several clients on my mind who are in chronic stress and overwhelm all the time so if they were to let's say stop just for 10 minutes a day and do something that gives them joy read a magazine or um sing their favorite song twice for the 10 minutes if they were to just isolate themselves for 10 minutes no phone no computer no kids just just me 10 minutes and they did that every single day wash rinse repeat how long one would that be effective and two how long do you think they would start to see it would take for them to start to notice changes in their stress response yeah that method is unlikely to be effective the reason is that in order to change anything in the brain, the specific thing that you want to change needs to be active. So that means that at the moment you start doing that thing that feels really good, you need to be feeling the thing that is stressing you out. So you may do that naturally, or you may not. So if you, let's say you're really stressed about um, something your daughter's going through at school, right? If you're not currently thinking about that and stressing about it, then you cannot make changes to your stress response to that. Yeah. And so you can instead, let's say, you know, you're, you're like, oh, it's my 10 minutes. I'm going to do my thing right now. You can go in your mind's eye and activate that by just thinking about your daughter and her struggle at school, mm -hmm. right? Once you think about it, you will probably start to feel it the way you have felt it before. And then, you know, the neural network is active. And you can make changes in it by doing something that makes you feel really safe, like what you were talking about. The other thing that needs to happen, though, in order to significantly change a neural network is to repeat it. The brain learns everything with repetition, tying your shoe, driving a car, all of it. And that includes emotional responses and behavioral responses. So... Um, when you do it the way you're talking about, or you just do one long rep mm -hmm. every day, that's a really the slow way to do it. The faster way to do it is to do a bunch of short reps in short succession in the same sitting. Okay. So that's, yeah. So that is way, way, way faster because you're getting your reps in, in a short period of time. And so oftentimes we would say to that person, okay, I want you to, at the beginning of the guided process, recall, you know, what's going on with your daughter at school. And then that person would go, oh yeah, I'm starting to feel some anxiety. It's like seven out of 10. We'd mm -hmm. be like, okay, great. So now what I want you to do is go do this other thing. This other thing that sends unequivocal messages of safety to your brain. Usually this is going to be something through both brain and body, right? So they're going to be doing some kind of movement or touching themselves in a way that feels calming, right? But also they're going to be doing something with their mind's eye that has that effect too. So like you were saying, could be their favorite song, could be, um, you know, their favorite memory. They go back to being at the beach last summer and they just feel amazing, right? There are many, many different ways to send signals of safety and we tailor it to the person. But then right after that, let's say that moment where they're doing that other thing, like the song might only last like. 30 seconds maximum. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go back and we're going to say, okay, think about your daughter and her school struggles again. Mm -hmm. And then they'll go like, oh, 
yeah, okay. I still feel a little stress around that, but it's better. And typically at that point, they'll be like, it's like a four. Yeah. And then we do another round and then we do another round, very quick rounds. And then very quickly, they're at a zero. When you get somebody down to a zero with something that they're stressed about, that means you have made significant changes in their neural network around that. And the next time they encounter it or think about it, they're likely to feel way less stressed, if at all. Mm -hmm. And then if they do still have a little bit of a response when they're in the situation, we'll tell them what to do to rewire the last little bit. But that's normal because when you're just imagining something, you're only usually partially activating the neural network. So you don't change it all. You just change most of it. Mm. So when somebody gets in the scenario is when they activate the whole thing and then you can change all of it. Yeah, I'm sure when you're using just memory, there is some kind of internal pushback as well. Back to Mm. what I was saying with this is woo-woo. How could this work kind of thing? Right, right. So with your Wired for Wellness, Get Wired for Wellness, um, I ha- I'm going to share the link in the notes, of course, but it's free, correct me if I'm wrong. So the f- program is six videos, uh, six guided processes, some worksheets, and then there's some testimonies and stories from other people. Yeah, so that is the Wired for Wellness free program, Mm -hmm. which is our way of giving all the information you need to change your brain to the public, right? Just like there's free nutrition and exercise information out there, we thought it was really vital for the world to have this information too Mm -hmm. and have it be accessible to everyone. So that's what that is. There's also one that's specific to anxiety, panic attacks, and phobias. Um, And you can find both of those at getwiredforwellness.com. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, we have a full paid membership program as well, which is really there for people who are wanting support and community and a lot more guidance as they go on this journey of rewiring their brain, because it, you will hit some moments where there, it, you need, um, nuanced information in terms of how to get to the root of a, a specific psychological issue. And so that that's why. I like, I do like that you have the free option first, because like we mentioned in the very beginning, most people don't know what this is. So giving them an introduction and that can kind of open their curiosity and then go, well, so far this has been great. I would like to take it to the next step, which no doubt people will because this conversation has been great. But I do like that you offer that because it's such a, a new topic for most people. You can give them that gateway. Well, let's just try it first and see if you see any progress. So that is great. This has been super enlightening. If you were to kind of wrap this up in kind of one sentence or one piece of advice for people in regards to how stress may be affecting them and how they could manage it just easily right now, what would that be? Mm -hmm. I would just say that, you know, if you look back on recent history in your life and you're seeing that you are developing symptoms or struggling with symptoms in many different body systems, if you are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma, you're very likely to benefit dramatically from this work. So at the very least, I highly recommend you take advantage of all the free resources we just mentioned. There are also more in our free Facebook group. So on getwideforwellness.com, there's a link for you to join that too and get some more of our free content. Um, but yeah, I would just say that um, you know this is profoundly transformative to both physical, mental, and emotional health. So yeah, if you're struggling with any of those issues, please don't ignore it. I ignored it for way too long and it led to me being sick for over 15 years. So I don't want that for anybody else. Yeah, and neither do I. And I always think we become health practitioners because our mess becomes our message. We learn and then we are (laughs) able to help others. 100%. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Karen Curitan. I will share all of your social media and links below. This has been really fascinating and you covered it perfectly. I think it's going to be really helpful for people to get an insight into what this neural training is and how the brain is affected by stress and life nowadays. (laughs) Yes, thank you. It was my pleasure and I really do hope it helps your listeners. Thank you very much. You have a great day. You too.